noises are defined as disagreeable sounds, but this suggests that they are no more than an annoyance, something to be put up with. There is increasing evidence that noise, on the scale that people who live in big cities have to deal with, is dangerous, and can give rise to serious health and social problems. Some of which, such as its effects on people's behaviour and anger levels, you might not have thought were caused by noise, and are health concerns. There is, of course, the almost constant noise of traffic, though this isn't a particularly modern problem. In ancient Rome, there were rules to minimise the noise made by the iron wheels of wagons, which battered the stones on the pavement, causing disruption of sleep. Traffic noise is one of the health hazards, as it can lead to other problems like noise-induced hearing impairment. It is also highly distracting, interfering with speech communication and leisure time relaxation. And while this doesn't drive you mad in the medical sense, it is intensely annoying and can lead to mental health problems. Also, noise, whether you work in a place where loud machinery is operating or not, can have an effect on performance at work. Though in itself not a health matter, this can lead to other problems. Yes, it's funny you should mention Merwin. Until about a year ago, I thought England was the only country that had a poet laureate. After all, it's a pretty odd job, isn't it? No salary to speak of, and just a barrel of wine or something as payment. <laughs> but he was, or is, the American poet laureate, isn't he? That's right. But quite a few other countries have one too. I know. I looked into it a bit. Other countries in the UK, for a start,、uh, Wales, as you'd expect, with their ice Stedfords and long poetic tradition. And Ireland and Scotland.、Mm. I think some places that were colonies or in the Commonwealth have them.、Uh, Canada, for example. And who's that wonderful Caribbean poet?、Um, the one that wrote Omaros.、Uh, Derek Walcott. That's him. He was the poet laureate of Saint Lucia. But what about the rest of Europe? Don't the French have such a thing? No, I don't think so. They've got the Academy, and you get elected to that if you're considered the best in your field.、Mm. But、uh, I think Germany might have. No, it wasn't Germany. Somewhere else, but I don't remember. By the way, you're a bit behind the times in thinking what they get paid as a barrel of wine. <laughs> <laughs> All that changed long ago. But one of the more recent ones asked to have it back. <laughs>
Readjusting to life in your own country after living abroad for some time is a little like recovering from jet lag after a long flight across several time zones. It takes time. And research indicates that after nine years of living in a foreign country, you never really do readjust. Of course, things have changed. Governments have come and gone. What you knew as countryside has become a suburb. New technologies have changed the way people go about their daily lives, and so on. These changes may well have been taking place in your adopted country, but they were happening while you were there, so you could adapt as you went along. Those are not the main difficulties, however. It is in the smaller, everyday things that you might experience what is known as culture shock, although it's not really a shock, but puzzling all the same. For example, the precise way to behave at a supermarket checkout may have changed, and in ordinary conversation, the frames of reference have changed, and quite often you find that you don't really know what people are talking about, even though they are speaking your native tongue.